So thank you very much, Sean. Uh, thank you, Danielle, and, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Uh, my name is Mike Fouché, and today we are doing our webinar, State Regulators Discuss the Status of Social Equity in Cannabis. Uh, before I get to introducing our panelists, uh, I want to uh, talk about our two sponsors. Voice Order is a leading edge technology company that provides fast, efficient, and integrated voice based ordering for dispensaries, growers, and consumers, including an easy to use application that streamlines the ordering process for your operations. Learn more at voiceordersolutions.com. One of their representatives will connect you by phone or email. And Grown In learns to pro exists to provide greater understanding of regulated cannabis industries. Grown In Learning, a licensed responsible vendor trainer in Illinois, Massachusetts, and other markets, provides required compliance training and diversity-focused professional growth programs for licensed cannabis operators. Want to learn more? Email sales at Grown In. So uh, we have three excellent, fantastic panelists today, and I want to get to them quickly, but first to introduce them, and if you can uh, give me a wave uh, as, uh, as I introduce you, uh, starting with Sean Collins. He's the Executive Director of Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission. He has built out and overseen operations of the East Coast's first adult use marijuana regulatory agency. Under Collins's leadership, Massachusetts adult use marijuana retailers opened in November 2018 with a fully regulated supply chain. Three and a half years later, the marketplace has generated more than $2.6 billion in sales for Massachusetts. Danielle Perry is Illinois' Cannabis Regulation Oversight Officer, who works with 15 state agencies to direct the regulation and taxation of Illinois' cannabis industry. Danielle's top priority for the office is ensuring Illinois reaches its, so Illinois, I'm sorry, its social equity goals of expungements, community and reinvestment, and diversifying the industry. She's been an urban agriculture nonprofit executive director who trained individuals with employment barriers and created Chicago's first and only USDA organic farm. And finally, Michelle Siegel has been commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection since 2017. Before that, from 2011 until her appointment as commissioner, Ms. Siegel served as the deputy commissioner for DCP. So uh, I'm very excited to have the three of you here today. Uh, and before we get started, uh, I, I can see it's already started rolling, but uh, our chat section is uh, a terrific place for conversation and discussion, and uh, we are going to be taking questions later. Please enter them into the Q&A, and I'll be the questions and asking our esteemed panelists for their thoughts. Um, so, but first, I want to start off with uh, Commissioner Siegel, and we'll do a round robin for the group. Um, in about 90 seconds or so, um, what can you say is broadly everything, not just necessarily Connecticut, but everywhere, what's the status of social equity in cannabis in your opinion right now? Um, I think it, it's something that's a, certainly on everybody's radar, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I think every state's looking at how to do it and how to do it right, but there, and we're all learning from each other. You know, in Connecticut, we've tried to take a multi-pronged approach. We've come in a little later than many states, so we've learned from that. Um, we're still early in it, so we'll see how how successful ours ours is. But a lot of thought went into it. Um, I think most states, ours included, have the criminal justice component of decriminalization and expungement as really the collateral consequences of these convictions. They go well beyond just job market consequences. It's pretty severe, and so I think that's a big piece of it. And one thing that we've learned and as we see what other states are doing is the need to be flexible and to adjust and monitor how things go. And so Connecticut has created a social equity council made up of uh, 15 members with backgrounds in you know, uh, civil justice and um, or social justice, civil rights, uh, economic development to really implement the social equity provisions that are woven into the statute, both related to the licensing, but more broadly, community uh, redevelopment. Um, so, Danielle, can you give us your thoughts in about 90 seconds? Sure, Mike. I, I, I want to kind of 
go off of Michelle, what I loved about what Michelle said is that she made it seem like equity was just something we all do. And to me, that's proof of how far social equity has come because there were states before us where equity was not in the conversation, not at all, <laughs> um, barely even some expungements. And so now we're at the point where a state like Connecticut is coming on and they feel like this is the standard. And to me, that's the blessing of where we're going and how far we've come thus far. We have so far to go. But the fact that Michelle said very clearly, I don't know that you can legalize at this point and not have a conversation around expungement and pardons, investing in communities and diversifying the industry, not just from ownership, but from an employment and vendor perspective. If that's the bar um, and every state is coming after us and we're just getting better at every state um though we are just starting and michelle said we have so far to go that's i'm i'm super excited that that's the standard now and i think that's because of a massachusetts and that's because of an illinois and i'm proud to be a part of that legacy that we created here that you can't just legalize collect the funds and put it in the state coffers you have to do something to help those communities that were impacted so to me that's that shows where we are and, and that we have far to go but we can do it Did we lose Mike? Is it frozen? I assume he's going to kick it to me next. Is that where we're headed? Go, Sean. Go. Go. Right. Sean. Yeah, I got frozen there. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, well, I think just building off of what both Michelle and Danielle said, I, and Danielle, especially build off your um, point, it, it is now ingrained in every aspect of legalization across the country, whether it be in the legislative work that's going on or even proposed through ballot question. Uh, and I think the the public is becoming much more aware of um, the potential of this industry, but also the history uh, that leads up to legalization. And speaking of and thinking about our work here in Massachusetts, uh, it's been an evolution here. It, it started off obviously as a ballot question that had a, a sentence and a clause. And then the legislature was breathing life into it. And our commission is trying to breathe even more life into it. Uh, what we're doing now, and I think where states are going, we're willing to assess. We're willing to look at our success, but also acknowledge uh, missteps where we can where we can correct and improve. And we're using data. We're using analytics to do it. Um, and one of our staff here said to me recently that there is uh, there's interest and opportunity. And I think that's a really powerful statement of people are coming forward and saying prohibition impacted me in my life. Uh, I, I have a conviction as one in my immediate family. And this industry represents an opportunity for me, and I'd, I'd like my um, my opportunity in this space. And what is Massachusetts? What is Illinois? What is Connecticut? Um, think about that. And I think that's a really powerful moment uh, that legalization brings um, for government and for new agencies and uh, and bureaucracy alike. So uh, it's an evolution, and it's also a, an ongoing assessment that we're making of our success. I, I want to start with just a, a way to talk about is that are out there that system that another state is using that that you'd like to borrow or use for am I totally dead uh, I think I got you Mike <laughs> I don't mind jumping in here uh, I think you asked about, um, you know, what are some things in other states that that you would steal or, or, or want? And I always sing the praises of Massachusetts and, and their social equity program. I, I think what Illinois did in the three prong approach has, you know, been a good start. You know, we've expunged half a million records. We have been able to change the face of our industry with over 50% of our new licensees being people of color. Um, and we've invested like $50 million of our tax revenue in communities across the state. So that's our starting point, right? But what we wanna see is that these licensees, these, in, these employees, people who are going into the space, who are working in our community colleges, that they can be supported by the state in a more robust way. What I, that's what I want to see. I want to see that we can support making sure we can bridge the gap for capital. And when I first took this job and read about Massachusetts, what I loved about their pro was that it was a program itself, not even what I loved about their program was that it was a holistic program um, and that they actually 
it felt like almost like an incubator when, when I was reading about it. And as I have talked to Sean and Cedric about the work they do to support the people in their program, um, I'm sure there are changes they may want to make. And But I'd love to see something like that replicated where we had a full staff just full of people who could support the people who are moving into our space. Um, and, and I would love to replicate that, Sean. I, I say it everywhere I go. Okay, folks, I'm sorry about that. I changed locations. I was having some Wi-Fi issues. Welcome to the new millennium. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for taking that, Danielle. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Michelle, could you tell me some thoughts that you have about other states that use programs that you would like to borrow? Um, yeah, and I, I think you'll find I, I don't know that there's any specific rule or any one state. In our, our law, we're one of the newer um, states to enter this. So the we our law just passed last year, but I think looking at it, you'll see Connecticut, look closely at what other states are doing. And, and we learned from things that worked well and things that maybe uh, didn't pan out the way people wanted. You know, we a lot of thought went into things like it's not just enough, you know, not just trying to to diversify licensing, but addressing the barriers to entry, the access to capital, the training, the workforce development, the, the, the broader needs that go with starting a new business. And so there's a lot of in our law discussing that, um, you know, we learned from things that maybe created barriers, community host agreements being one of them. And we very expressly, and these are ones where towns can kind of require payments from businesses to be in their community. And so there's a, a real limit in Connecticut to uh, towns being able to do that. So that's certainly something we learned from. But I think more broadly, as we've seen how other states have rolled out, what we saw is that you it, it's something that you have to monitor. You can't just pass a law once and be like, all right, done. Um, you, you've got to see how, how does it play out in practice. And so having the social equity council that can really be focused on monitoring and then making recommendations to the legislature for adjustments. And, and importantly, this is not just an advisory board. This council can hire an executive director, hire staff, and is really tasked with implementing the social equity components of the law in Connecticut that are really woven in throughout the statute. And Sean, uh, I'm not sure you were able to answer that question. I, I think Danielle took up while I was interregnum. Uh, Sure. I'm happy to. She was complimentary of Massachusetts, so I, I'm always grateful for that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to pay it right back, though. I think one of the things I really appreciate about this space, and it, it is the regulatory component as well as the industry itself, is um, there are active conversations, and each of each jurisdiction is kind of a unique lab in that sense. Of we're all working toward a, a good, noble end. As far as one, I think is acknowledging that the war on drugs did real harm to real people. And we now have an opportunity um, not to fix that, that that's real, that's suffered, that's experienced. Um, but instead, I think to acknowledge it, one, uh, but then actually put some resources in place uh, to help people in a very real, sincere way. Uh, and one of the things that I look across the country now, and we were one of the early states that had social equity programming and requirements and a mission based in our embedded in our statute, um, we've built a lot of things. We're adding resources now. We're, we're building out a team and staff and, and really trying to be robust about it. Um, but where the states like Connecticut and Illinois have done a great job is they put real money uh, in place. And they're, they're taking that money and investing it back in their industry, uh, in people that are aspiring entrepreneurs or people that want to actually in, work in and engage in this industry. Uh, and if I look around the, the country and think, what would Massachusetts benefit from next? resources. It is the single biggest hurdle to this market uh, that any entrepreneur is going to suffer from and, and, and work through and have to overcome. Uh, and I think if you look at uh, specifically those folks that we would identify as social equity or economic empowerment applicants are at an even worse competitive disadvantage. And real money goes a long way to make a big difference there. And we have not done that in Massachusetts yet. You're on mute. I got it. Uh, I want to ask all of you, um, 
there courts have been striking down residency requirements uh, left and right. Um, I know in Massachusetts, you're probably paying close attention to Maine. Uh, and there's also been cases in Missouri and in Michigan. Um, is residency critical to ensuring diversity? Uh, that, that has been a discussion that other states have had about whether or not they can still ensure diversity without uh, a residency requirement. Um, can, you, can you address that, Commissioner Siegel? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a tricky question because I, how you define diversity, you know, every state has its own way of defining who is a social equity applicant. In Connecticut, uh, residency is a piece of it. And the way our law was designed is to first identify which are the communities that were disproportionately impacted in the war on drugs. And it's looking at things like um, unemployment rates and importantly, sort of um, arrests. Um, for drug related charges and sort of looking at that and saying, okay, these are the communities that are disproportionately impacted. How can we try to, to kind of target our social equity efforts to those communities? And, you know, a big piece of it is a social equity applicant is somebody who either grew up in one of those communities or has lived there for um, in the recent past, I believe it's five of the last 10 years. So if, if you take that residency out of it, I mean, they don't have to be a current resident, but if you if you untether residency from, from that, it really takes apart the, the social equity definition that we have in Connecticut. Okay, uh, Sean, can you talk about that? I mean, how, how does it matter in Massachusetts? Um, I, I, there's kind of two parts to it that I would look at here. Um, a, a conviction in your background or in, let's say, you know, conviction of one of your parents, perhaps, um, it doesn't matter where you live, that's going to follow you. So you could be a resident of Massachusetts and um, today, and that conviction is still going to impact you just as much as if you were living in Illinois. Um, as far as the programming and eligibility and things like that, I think it's an investment that Massachusetts is making of taxpayer resources into programming and efforts. And so what we're seeing across the country is, is like programs and like um, opportunities being established. But I, I, what I'm sort of describing here to you is that the impact of the war on drugs was a national effort. And it, it didn't really care much about the uh, geographic boundaries of jurisdictions. Uh, and that includes in Massachusetts cities and towns as well. Um, and so I, I think what Connecticut, Illinois, and other states too, it's not just isolated to these three states, um, we're acknowledging that past with eligibility for things. Uh, but then we're investing local dollars, taxpayer money, uh, into this program. So uh, we've got residency for other license types as well. We've got residency requirements, uh, but also mindful of the past too. Um, neighborhoods themselves, uh, gentrification happens. Uh, and so what may have happened during the course of the war on drugs, that community, that neighborhood might look totally different today. Uh, but we need to appreciate that uh, the impact was felt by people and not just um, political or, or geographic boundaries. So I'm kind of mixed as far as residency is concerned, to be honest. Mike, if you don't mind me jumping in, you Go don't right have to call on me. <laughs> I would say, you know, just to follow up on something Sean said is the war on drugs impacted people, but it absolutely impacted our communities. And if you grew up in one of those communities, if you live in one of those communities now, you've worked in one of those communities where the unemployment rate is incredibly high, the, the crime rates, the, the percent of kids who are receiving school lunch, where you can't even find a grocery store, um, where our community, where people can't find jobs, it's tough to have a conversation around equity and diversity, you know, around states. If you don't, if you're not honest with yourself about the, the, the devastation that this war on drugs had in our, in our communities. So when you think about that, when you take that question out of context, I could see why you could say, hey, residency may not legally be fair or something. But in context to what this did to our communities and where our communities are right now, I think people from those communities want to see people who grew up in those communities or who live in those communities be owners in those communities. 
they want to see people who live in those communities now employed in this industry and owners you know what i mean so yes i think it absolutely matters where people live if you ask representative carol ammons in peoria or somebody in east st louis downstate they want to see people from peoria owning those businesses not people who live in new york or connecticut or massachusetts or somewhere who own some big company coming in and taking up space in their land that's what happens in our communities somebody else who's not from our community takes space in our community gets all the benefit from it and then we struggle so i don't think that if you can say equity is specifically social equity is really around the war on drugs and repairing harm from it, then you do want to see that people who were in fact harmed and the communities that were harmed will see something that they'll get some benefit and that their lives will be transformed or changed because of this. And so I think residency does matter when you think of it in that context. So that that mixes in a little bit with something else that Sean had said earlier, and, and I want to get him to follow up on this one first, which is, is that there needs to be financial support for organizations that are trying to get started in various communities. That's hard for government. Uh, you know, the government isn't really traditionally in the business of getting equity stakes in businesses. Uh, you know, how do you do that? How, how can you think about it that way? I and mean, Sean, do you want to start with answering that one? Um, it shouldn't be hard, right? There's, there's a pretty simple uh, investment calculation as far as um, this industry is going to generate new revenue for any state um, and reinvesting that revenue is a pretty straightforward uh, proposition. Um, the other things that states can do, because we know that um, by the time that that revenue is coming in, let's say it's a you know a special tax, excise tax, sales tax, etc., um, that means that your industry has already begun; it's underway. And by the time, if you're going to take that revenue in particular and reinvest it, if your reinvestment opportunity or goals or objectives are to then allow folks to get into the industry, it might be too late by then um, because you're already underway. And I think that's it's worthy of consideration. The other things that we've done in Massachusetts, though, are things like fee waivers. Um, that's not money out. It's money that we're foregoing. It's revenue opportunity that we're foregoing. But if you're thinking about starting a business and you're looking at your runway of how do I actually get to operational status, um, you're going to, especially when you know that capital is really hard to come by, and you know that the, the state that you want to get a license in is charging $50,000 for a license fee or $15,000 for a license fee. But they're saying if you're a social equity applicant, if you're an economic empowerment applicant, we'll waive it, we'll forego that revenue. That's one less check you've got to write, that's one less um, bottom line you've got to worry about. But I, I think from my standpoint, by and large, this new industry is representing new revenue streams for states. And um, it, it shouldn't be uh, all that politically challenging to um, reinvest it back, so. I might be oversimplifying it, but I think it's a pretty straightforward proposition. Okay. Uh, Danielle, you want to answer that? You've been nodding pretty vigorously. Well, you know, I agree with Sean, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Illinois, we have a low interest loan program and um, one of, I was going to use this uh, as an example of something I would change from a regulatory perspective um, if we ever discuss that, but I do think you can take the excise tax and just say that we will say a portion of this fund goes into supporting businesses. I think one of the challenges to that is, like Sean said, that often comes after everything started. So we have to figure out a way, not just to get you money, but how do we get you money quickly? How do we get you money at the front end before? Um, so one, how can we simplify our applications and reduce fees like Sean said, which we did in Illinois as well, um, or even do complete fee waivers on the front end and how we make these processes simpler so you don't have to spend so much money through our application process um, so that by the time you're coming to us, we're helping you capitalize at the point of the front. And then maybe 
if we had grants, loans, maybe even some lines of credit, support on real estate, I do think government could work together better. I've been working with the city of Chicago and the mayor's office about how we could support our small businesses that are coming into their city. I think we as government, like Sean said, can make this work. I think Illinois loan program is a great example of that. And look at some cities as well. I'm thinking of Oakland. They're putting money right in the hands of folks. So can it be done? Yes, you see states and cities doing it. But a lot of this is about, you know, um, I think also I've been working on some private public partnerships. Can we try to bridge the gap for folks to bring investment in at a big level so that so we can, um, you know, make things happen. And somebody said in the comments, well, where's the loan program? That's the other thing. Government is not a business. It's not going to, even if you went to the bank to get a loan, it's not going to come in a matter of days. So government doesn't move at the speed of light <laughs> and this industry does. And so we will have to figure out how to be more nimble and how to be able to, um, but also with equity in mind. One of the challenges with our loan program moving swiftly was that we gave a lot of time so that these applicants who are all 100% social equity had time to correct their loan application, had time to get the right documents in. That doesn't typically happen in government. Usually you get 10 days to you know, submit the deficiency and it's over. But because we're thinking about equity in mind, we gave extensions, we gave you second and third and fourth, fifth tries. And we looked at who had the greatest need. So if Sean has 10 other investors with millions of dollars, but Michelle and I don't have much, we want to make sure me and Michelle get the money, but that's equity, but that takes time. And so some of the challenges with that is you, we, we want to make sure you get the loan. We want to make sure the right person gets the loan, but also there's not an, an unending amount of money here. We have a, a finite amount of money and a certain amount of people who need to get it. We have to take the time to make sure there's equity in how we're giving it out. So that's the answer to the loan program. Yes, it's a great idea, but it, it takes time, especially when you're thinking about equity. And that's one of the challenges with equity, being, being able to have the thoughtfulness and the support that you want to give takes a level of time that some people don't have. And that's one of, the, one of our struggles. Again. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. Uh, Commissioner Siegel, do you have any thoughts on on this? You know, how can government get involved in this idea of supporting businesses? Is that even possible? Oh, it's certainly possible, and I I think you know um, both Danielle and Sean covered a lot of it uh, of the different ways you can do it. So yeah, there's direct loans. Um, there's things like uh, facilitating access to capital as well, whether it's creating incentives for others to invest in these businesses. Um, Connecticut has um, some incentives for existing medical businesses to form equity uh, joint ventures. And it's a way to get both capital and maybe some experienced people partnering with um, equity applicants to, to help them get kind of started faster. So there's different ways. And then there's investment in providing things like technical assistance, workforce education. Um, and then there's more broadly, you know, just doing reinvestment into communities uh, more broadly. It may not help somebody get into the cannabis marketplace specifically, but they're, you know, it, it more broadly addresses some of the broader harms that uh, Daniela was talking about before. Uh, and I have a, a first question from the audience. And, and if you can try and, and answer this somewhat succinctly, because we have a lot of great questions from the audience, uh, from Tim Johnson asks, with financial support seen as a primary point in addressing social equity, would it be fair to employ economic equity language via micro grows, craft grows, or co-ops to open a broader base of participation opportunities? And, and I know Massachusetts and Illinois has something like those. Uh, Danielle, can you start by answering and then, then ask Sean? Mike, restate the question just one more time. Sure. With financial support seen as a primary point in addressing social equity, would it be fair to employ economic equity language with grows, craft grows, or smaller co-op grows to open a broader base of participation opportunities? Yeah, and and um, and Cedric and I in Massachusetts have this conversation all the time. Is that yes, I think it's powerful to have licenses if I'm getting the question right, licenses that may not need as much capital. 
um, like a craft grow or a micro grow in, in Michigan or other states, um, like delivery. And so, you know, I'm always singing the praises of Massachusetts. So let me say the great, a great example there is delivery in Massachusetts and how they made that a social equity only license for a short amount of time. But I think one of the challenges we see with some of these license types is you have to make sure that this is something that can be profitable. So Mike, I know you said be succinct, but I will make this point. If we have a craft grow and you only have 5,000 square feet, how profitable will you be able to be? So we right now in the legislature in Illinois, we're having a conversation about whether we should expand craft grow canopy size so that people can actually grow in a space where they can really get a brand up and running. And maybe you're not competing with a big, huge company, but that you can be successful. Um, we're trying to make sure transporters can be able to get some kind of part of the lion's share of the transporting business. So you can make a license that somebody can afford, but it is our job as regulators to make sure that you can still have a functional, profitable business. And so I believe in what Massachusetts did of making something social equity only, but we have to do what we can to regulate it in a way where people can still be profitable. That's to me, the, one of the most important things. Sean, you want to take that one up? Uh, of course, yeah. I, I think building off of, of Danielle's commentary, so I think she's absolutely right. Um, one of the things I've, I found myself saying quite a bit, and I think it's more just to educate the public, is that we don't view social equity um, in Massachusetts as a license type. It's not a specific license that you're eligible for and therefore ineligible for the others. Um, this is a marketplace that needs to, and we have strict license caps in Massachusetts as well, to avoid that uh, conglomerate coming in and absorbing the entirety of the market. Uh, and we have things like craft cooperatives and micro businesses, and we're seeing folks pursue those licenses. Um, one of the things that we want to see, though, is folks grow from those license types. And a, a micro business is a good example. It's a combined product manufacturing and cultivation, but a small scale. So it's, Presumably, small businesses want to become bigger businesses. And how do you grow outside of that scale? Um, but I think the one thing we don't want to do is, um, is kind of push folks into specific license types and say, well, as a social equity applicant, you have exclusive access to delivery. That shouldn't be in a way to discourage them from being retail, though. That shouldn't discourage them from being product manufacturing. If you have a dream and an aspiration in this industry, you should be able to achieve it and, and pursue it um, and not be, I guess, um, suggested that this is the only license type that you can pursue. And we're gonna erode all barriers. Really, it's gotta be across the industry. And, and I think, uh, again, as I touched on access to capital is the single largest barrier. And that's a comprehensive approach that shouldn't be specific to licenses or specific types. Uh, Commissioner Siegel, you wanna wrap this up? Um, yeah, I, th I think a lot of, we're, we're in agreement on a lot of things and probably partly because Connecticut looked at Illinois and Massachusetts. So. Um, but we did look to, you know, what are some license types that may be a little easier. So we, for example, have a micro cultivator license. But one of the things it, it's I think 2,000 to 10,000 square feet. But every year you can you can add on to it till eventually you just merge in to become a full blown cultivator, which can be a much larger facility. But it's a way for people to get in earlier and at a smaller scale and then ramp up to a larger size. Uh, Delivery is another example of one we have where. The barriers to entry may be lower since you don't necessarily need the large scale facility. So we looked at a lot of that and kind of reinforcing what Sean said, you know, we, we didn't create, well, this is social equity only, but um, a lot of ours are, are done through a, a lottery process where 50% are going to be for social equity applicants in, in each type. And that's sort of how, how that design, but a lot of it is building on um, what has been said and kind of what is reflected in the, the programs we saw in other states that we, we thought made sense to try in Connecticut. And then I have a couple of specific questions for you from the audience. Uh, Commissioner Siegel, someone, uh, Heather Sullivan asks, what is the status of workforce development requirements and programs in Connecticut? How does a licensed applicant get involved with workforce development programs? So those are, uh, that's a program that is um, under, and, and it is a little complicated. So we do have this social equity council, which is its own entity within Connecticut. Although, um, you know, my agency, it's, uh, you know, we have one of the seats on the council. So it, the, the social equity council is developing the workforce development plans and working through that. And in fact, one of the 
of people on the council is required to be and is a member of the executive branch with expertise in workforce development. So it's all happening through that social equity council as opposed to the Department of Consumer Protection. And, and I know at a high level, I know it's it's in progress and, and work has been done, but I can't because it's outside my agency. I don't know the specifics of where it is right now. Okay. Uh, and for Danielle, a, a specific question for you from Salvatore Giovingo. With loans in Illinois, what are some requirements to actually access those cannabis loans in Illinois? Does it require a credit, particular credit score, income statements, uh, those sort of things? Uh, great question. Um, I'm happy to follow up with you and get you that one, like a basic application. But uh, one of the first things, and I talked about it a little bit, is that we do ask about your principal officers. We do try to see um, the asset range of the people who are involved in your in your um, business. One, like I said before, because we want to really see where the need is. Um, we we ask some basic financial questions, but I would say. Um, one of the things we're trying to make sure is that you don't see these requirements. I don't want you to hear me say like anything that you feel is a requirement that will just completely bar you um, because we are using loan providers or servicers who will help us. They're parts that the state will take on. So if you are someone who maybe a traditional bank would just deny that the state will take up, you know, more of your loan or, or support it in a way so that you can still get that loan. Um, and we will just have to take a higher percentage for yours. So I know I'm not giving you the rundown of all the requirements, but hear me say that it's done this way through the state itself so that we can make sure that somebody who may be worried about, like, you know, might not, might not feel like you are someone who may be eligible would be. Uh, but I'm happy if you put your email in the chat to get you more information about the loan program. This is a specific question for Sean, but actually, I think all three of you might want to answer this one way or another. Uh, this is from an anonymous person. I saw one of the 2022 goals for the Massachusetts CCC is to ensure commissioners and public have access to data and evidence-based publications to support internal decision-making uh, to work on the impact on disproportionately harmed communities from the regulated marijuana market. How, Sean, do you see data and research tying into that goal? What kinds of data do you think would be helpful for the CCC? And, and that data question, I want to ask uh, the other two panelists. Uh, the question, it, it speaks to me a little bit. It, I love data. I, I love data analytics. And I think especially in this space, in this industry, because it is, uh, from a legal perspective, it's new in a way, you're starting a, a legal marketplace from nothing. That does not dismiss or, or suggest for a second that we're not migrating uh, a market as well, which is a, a, a task, but um, from a, starting from zero from a revenue and how does this industry work amongst itself? Uh, all of us that are, are serving in a regula regulatory capacity are sitting on really valuable information about this industry. Um, how, does it, how does supply chain work? Uh, what are price points, and, and also even some of the licensing activity. What, what is that information telling us? Where are we, what license types are attractive? Where are they going to be located? And so I, I feel it's really selfish of us to sit on this, this treasure trove of information. And so we pursued in Massachusetts an open data strategy. And part of it is also to earn credibility as a brand new agency. The Cannabis Control Commission being an independent state agency, we didn't exist five years ago. Uh, so part of it is to the public here, don't take our word for it. Here's all the information you need to hold us accountable. Specifically tying back to the areas of disproportionate impact, I think one of the things that helps agencies and the public, or I'm sorry, and helps regulators build credibility with the public is just sharing the source of information you're relying upon. What information did you use to make that decision? How did you come to that conclusion? And I'm really proud that we've got uh, a really robust research agenda, and we're gonna be driven by facts. We're gonna be driven by analysis. And not only that, we're going to show our work. And, and so when we identify uh, early days of the commission, we identified 29 cities and towns as being specific areas of disproportionate impact. Uh, we recently undertaken an effort to modify or to reevaluate re those cities and towns uh, and, and layer on additional data sets. And it includes, um, we've looked at unemployment rates, we've looked at arrest rates in certain communities, um, but our commissioners, and I give them a ton of credit, 
have asked even more pointed questions. Well, we know that the wheels of justice as they turn get progressively more disproportionate in their impact. So arrests become convictions, convictions become incarcerations. Uh, and again, the justice system, as it, especially during the course of the war on drugs, uh, had a greater, greater impact and more disproportionate impact. And specifically, I want to acknowledge on black and brown communities. Um, and so our data, our research shows that. Uh, and I think that's why we want to use information and also share it publicly uh, so that there, that way there's confidence that this is not an arbitrary decision. It's based on information and more importantly, it's based on this information. Uh, and if the public has objections or questions, we're available to uh, either defend it or admit that we should maybe change gears. Uh, Commissioner Siegel, can you answer the question, but slightly differently, what data and information do you think you would like to be able to have or, or that you find particularly valuable in your decision making about impact on disproportionate communities? Um, I, you know, a lot of it, and we need to keep evaluating and working with with our social equity council, but I, I think a lot of it is some of the stuff Sean was talking about, you know, um, unemployment, arrest rates. Um, the, in, those are some of the big ones is sort of looking at what, what are the harms and there's, you know, very specific either criminal justice and economic data that kind of flows into that. And some of that, you know, already is woven into to what's in Connecticut's law. So the disproportionately impacted area really specifically requires a look at census tracts and where do, whether it's, you know, where do those um, kind of criteria where, really stand out from, from other communities, particularly drug-related arrests um, and those types of things. And looking at, you know, as you think about social equity applicants, looking at, uh, you know, it, um, income rates and things like that. So I think there's a lot of data out there and, and census data is updated. So there was some talk about how some communities through gentrification really change in scope. So I think it's important that to remember data is not something that, that that's a snapshot, but it's really a moving picture. And so you you have to constantly not just find your data set, but it, even if you think it's one that makes sense, always update that data to, to be sure you're getting a, a clear picture. Danielle, jump right in. Well, I, I, I think what Sean was talking about is phenomenal. And I'd love to see all of us get to that place. And immediately I was like, let me email Sean and see if we can have a conversation about what, what this looks like. Um, but I do think it's imperative that we are, I think a lot of times what Sean said is true, government collects data. I don't know if government always analyzes data and uses that, therefore uses it to make uh, decisions. And also, I don't know if we're, we're always effectively translating what we're learning to the legislators who can make the changes. Often they will not understand or know what's happening in, in this particular field. And it's, it's really an education piece. And so I do think it's important for us to do that. One thing we're doing in Illinois is that on our grant sides, we have program evaluators who started from the very beginning on evaluating the effectiveness and the impact that our grants are having in community. So we're investing in community. People always call me and say, well, can you see a change? And I know people expect that this is magic and that um, disinvestment and structural racism will disappear with uh, $50 million, but if it's not going to, but we can try to track how this money in, that's invested in our communities will, will make impacts in our community. So we, we added evaluations and, and that comes from data and analysis at the very beginning. And then on the second level, one thing that the statute, uh, when they passed uh, legal, legalized cannabis in Illinois, it requires my office to do an assessment of the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry, and then also to evaluate whether there are barriers to entry. And so I did that in my first year by sending out a survey, I had a thousand questions. I sent it to every company who worked in the industry. I know they hate me, but um, I asked about, you know, who works in the industry, who owns in your industry, who's on your board. I asked about all the vendors um, and it was so many questions. It was a little hard to, to eat through, but what we did this year was we partnered with the University of Illinois Business School and they made three different surveys that went directly to the firms, 
directly to our employees and directly to our vendors. So this year, with the help of one of our state universities, we'll be able to really get that analysis done and be able to provide it to the country, really, so that you can see what diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like in this state. And I'm excited. I, I'm really hopeful it will come out this summer. So I, I do think data is helpful, but we have to figure out a way how to like actually do the analysis of it and get it out to folks like like Sean said. And so we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, I'd like to ask one more question of each of you, which is, you know, can you name for me uh, one important thing about social equity programs in your state that you'd like everyone to know? Uh, and so Danielle, can you start off with that one? Sorry to give you the question out of the blue there. Yes, thank you, Mike, for a no notice. No, I'm kidding. Um, off the top of my head, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, when you hear about Illinois, people say no licenses have been given out. And every time I read it, I cringe because it's just not true. <laughs> and our our social equity measures got deduced to the dispensary licenses somehow. And I think you do the country and you do people a disservice, particularly social equity a disservice, when everything that we do in equity from the expungements, 500,000 expungements, 20,000 pardons from the investment that we've made in community, from the community colleges we have working in the space to the loan program, uh, to you know just all the things we've done get deduced to this sound bite that is actually not factual. We have released 150 licenses. Of those 150, over 50% are people of color, over 40% are black. And I think I like to call that out. Um, 12 of those licensees are 100% black owned businesses. We have eight 100% white owned businesses on the agricultural side, but now we have 12 100% black owned businesses, five of which are black women. And so I just like to call that out into the space so that people know that what you see is not always true. We are making um, strides here and I'm proud of what we've done, but I, even though I know we have so much further to go. So thank you, Mike, for the platform and being able to say that. I hope from now on, everybody reports it that way. Um, but even if you don't, I'm glad you gave me the chance to say it out loud. Remember that I gave you this platform when I ask you very difficult questions that you don't want to answer. Uh, so, Commissioner Siegel, uh, do you have any thoughts on anything you'd like people to know about your social equity program? Um, yeah, and it's one I've talked about a lot. I think one important thing Connecticut did was recognize that social equity is going to be something that's going to be, we're going to have to learn from, and it's not something a single regulator, I couldn't just go out and implement a perfect social equity program. And I think the creation of this council that has, you know, 15 people and, and, you know, some of them are government officials like me or my designee, but are come from the outside and have this broad, broad range of expertise, whether it's in civil rights, social justice, um, you know, uh, in investment in businesses, having the existence of that body that brings in a lot of stakeholders and a lot of expertise to implement and oversee social equity, you really have that then broader input into how should the program roll out and how should it, how should it adjust. And I think that's an important thing is, is designing something that is built into it, a real kind of opportunity for regular monitoring and recalibrating. And Sean, I'll let you wrap it up. Uh, I, I guess I'll end where I began ultimately, um, which is it, our program is, it's ever evolving. And it's evolving not because it needs to change or because we got it wrong. It's, it's evolving to meet the needs of the people that we intend to serve. Um, and they are a crucial, critical aspect to our success. Um, as far as we, we survey constantly, I can kind of empathize with Danielle as far as we survey a ton and we ask a lot of questions and we, we probe to be better. We wanna be better, we aspire to be better. Um, but I'd also say as part of a sales pitch, if you are even remotely curious about this industry, that program is available to you um, if you're eligible for it. And I think I also wanna acknowledge that there's plenty of people as far as we define eligibility in a, a very direct way. There's folks that are just on the cusp of being eligible for it that can still benefit from a lot of the programming that goes on around this industry. But as far as the, the pitch, as far as whether or not you're curious, 
it's because we we have tracks. We have a, an entry re-entry track of if you just you want to work in this industry or you're you're re-entering uh, society from incarceration and, and we you're curious about it. We have a um, entrepreneur level track. You want a license. Um, there's the the manager side. I want to be a head of cultivation, head of retail. We also have an ancillary track that I think is really interesting to me and it's something that I think is really powerful. I don't want to touch the plant. I don't want to be a business owner, but I have I have a conviction in my background and my immediate family. I live in, within one of those areas of disproportionate impact, but I'm an IT specialist. I am an electrician. Uh, I'm an HVAC specialist. This industry, I think, could be beneficial to me in my career, my business. Uh, we want you to come through our doors. We want to help you understand this industry. We want to provide you the technical assistance you need to succeed, to succeed excuse me, in whatever path you want to pursue. Um, so that's kind of the, the commercial I'll offer is that if you're even remotely curious, reach out to us. Uh, and then secondly is don't expect this to be a stagnant program because we want to be better at the next cohort of our um, social equity program participants and for them. So uh, in a way it's, you get to help us build it because we need your help. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and I want to thank the three of you. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Sean Collins from Mass CCC, Daniel Perry from uh, Il the Illinois Cannabis Regulatory Officer, is that correct? And uh, Commissioner Michelle Siegel from Connecticut DCP, and our sponsors, Voice Order and Grown In Learning. And for everyone watching here today, our next webinar is going to be on April 21st. It's going to be the business of micro and small grow operations. And a reminder that on April 11th, we'll begin to have a paywall. So make sure you keep getting grown in reporting by subscribing at grownin.com slash subscribe. Thank you all very much. Thanks to my dog and uh, have a lovely day, everybody. Thanks for participating. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.